Good evening and welcome. I'm Tim Marshall, the Provost of the New School, and it's, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this evening's event. Tomorrow's, tonight's program marks the launch of a partnership between the New School and Ashoka, and I hope and believe it will be transform transformative for both our organisation and for the field of social entrepreneurship. I'm pleased and honoured to announce that Ashoka has selected the New School to be part of the Change Makers Campus Initiative. This is a three-year program to create new educational models to support and develop social entrepreneurship. The New School's work with Ashoka will include the participation of students and faculty from across the university who will work to create various programs, courses, internships and other opportunities that will enable students to become change makers. This initiative will involve an active engagement with Ashoka, its network of social entrepreneurs around the world and a growing group of universities around the country. The university has long emphasised a cross-disciplinary approach to problem solving, working to bring together students and faculty from design, liberal arts and social sciences to explore the transformative benefits of collaboration. The Ashoka Changemaker Initiative offers an opportunity to expand and extend our capability to support positive creative leaders dedicated to social innovation. And tonight you'll hear from a remarkable, remarkable group of social entrepreneurs about their work. But I'd first like to start with a few acknowledgements of some very special people in the audience. First of all, I would like to introduce Henry Arnhold, who's down here. He is a long-standing and very, very generous trustee of the New School and a member of the Board of Governors of the New School for Social Research as well. In fact, this building we're in is named after his wife, Sissy. Last year, Henry spearheaded a celebration of NSSR's 75th anniversary in Berlin, where Angela Merkel was our keynote speaker, and I had the delight of being there. It was a really remarkable event that he put together. And tonight we have Arnold, Henry to, to thank for the opportunity to have Paul Pollock among our speakers. He actually introduced us to him some time ago. Second, I want to introduce Steve Bloom. Uh, he too is a trustee and also chair of the Board of Governors of Milano. I'm not sure if he's here. There he is, Steve, excellent. Next month, New School will recognise Steve for his service to both the New School and Milano with a Distinguished Service Award, of which Henry is also a recipient. So thank you for coming, Steve, and it's great to see you here. And finally, I want to acknowledge Michelle Kahana, who's down here, who has joined Milano faculty as a professor of professional practice in the area of social entrepreneurship. It was Michelle who brought the opportunity to join Ashoka Changemakers Campus, Campus Initiative to the New School so that our community across the university's divisions can benefit and participate. In addition to Michelle, there's a growing team of faculty and students who are working on this initiative, including Dennis Derrick of Milano, Jusha Gogia, who's also the student president, the, the president of the Student Senate. I'm not sure, I don't see him here yet. Mark Johnson from the Graduate Program in International Affairs, Anna Rabinovitz of Parsons, I know it's down there, and Rochelle Dawn Schaefer of Milano and head of Net Impact, a student group, who I imagine is here somewhere. I look forward to seeing how this unique university-wide initiative develops over the coming years. So would you please give all these people a round of applause who've been so instrumental in this. Each of you has a program which includes the biographies of all of our speakers, so to save time I'm going to skip over describing their impressive and very distinguished work, but thank them for coming to the New School to share their experience. And now I'm going to hand you over to the wonderful Professor Bruce Nussbaum, Professor of Innovation and Design at Parsons, who is chairing our session. So Bruce, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. This is uh, one of the greatest treats for me, and I think it's an important moment for a new school. It's really very exciting to have Ashoka here as a partner. This is a really, really big deal, uh, and it promises to do great things for the students uh, at the new school and for the faculty and for all of us who can get associated with this partnership. I really think it's hugely exciting. Um, for me, it's also particularly uh, exciting to meet one of my heroes, uh, Paul Pollock, who I've followed at Business Week for many years and um, actually now get to meet with him and to uh, drink water with him, which is uh, highly symbolic to me. Um, we're going to shape the event tonight in the following fashion. We're going to talk for about an hour, uh, talk being uh, each of the people up here, and I'm kind of sorry we're up here talking at you, but that's the way it's going to be. 
uh, for about five minutes and then open it up to a conversation among ourselves and very quickly open it up to a conversation, a conversation among all of us. Uh, so I'm hoping we have some really great engagement. I hope we can um, tell some stories, uh, explain some facts, uh, describe the space that we're calling social innovation, social entrepreneurship, uh, and bring in uh, especially the student audience uh, and have them engage over the next months and years in this partnership and in creating services, products, experiences uh, that do good as well as do. So let me begin by, let's start with Ashoka and uh, the representative from Ashoka. Okay, thanks. I'm Lisa Nitza. I am not in your, uh, in your bios. Uh, I am uh, here representing one of my colleagues, uh, Diana Wells. I'm a vice president at Ashoka and very, very excited to be here. I think uh, the reason we're all here is we know that the world's problems are outstripping the solutions that we've got to them, but not necessarily the resources are necessary to solve them. And the problem is that those resources are locked up in silos. They're in corporations, they're in universities, they're in government, they're in citizen sector organizations. Um, they're in foundations. And what we need to do is we need to break down those silos. We need to combine the world's resources with a capital R to solve the world's problems while having all of the actors in society operating in their own best interests and in the interests of their organizations. And that's really what social entrepreneurs have figured out how to do. Um, Ashoka was started in the 80s when our founder, Bill Drayton, um, won a MacArthur Genius Award, and this enabled him to take a full year of his life, I mean, what a treat, to try to figure out how to most effectively and sustainably solve human suffering around the world. And the answer that he came to after finding brilliant solutions to social problems in all the most unexpected local places was that if we were really going to activate and implement the greatest thinking, and the most practical creativity in ways that would have far-reaching impact and be sustainable. We do it by finding entrepreneurs, people that are more equal than others, um, and a different, and, and just a different uh, breed of cat, and supporting those entrepreneurs, networking them all the way around the world so that they could learn from and amplify each other's work. So that's really how Ashoka was formed. That was the theory of change she came up with. It's not going to be international aid organizations. It's not going to be religious groups. It's not going to be nation states. It's going to be from the ground up, entrepreneurs, well networked in a global network that is going to get the job done. So nearly 30 years later, what Ashoka represents is a global network of local entrepreneurs with brilliant solutions to social problems. And we support our social entrepreneurs who are really people that have built businesses that solve these social problems with funding from business entrepreneurs, from corporations, foundations, and from other social entrepreneurs. So we have people in our network that are addressing social needs of all sorts health, human rights, environment, job creation, and we don't dictate what kind of problem they are going to be solving. We just have a criteria for deciding that we're going to support them that enables us to choose the greatest change leaders in the world in our, in our definition of them. And in that way, we stay current with the evolution of social need and with the evolution of social in innovation to, to uh, bring about that need. We support the entrepreneur, not the enterprise. And that's because the businesses these entrepreneurs create need to stand on their own two feet if they're going to have real impact. We bet on entrepreneurs. And people uh, that are just, as I was saying earlier, uh, different and more equal than others, that have a passion and a commitment and an intelligent practicality, and more than anything, a stubbornness that's going to help them push through things. And there are a number of them on this panel. In pursuing this vision, we found time and again that the most effective communities, organizations, and associations are those with the highest percentage of people who are change makers. People who feel incentivized and responsible for changing 
what they, what they uh, uh, see as wrong in their environment without walking by it and for fixing what they feel is not right. We have found that our fellows, who are the people that we support around the world, all share in common the experience that they had when they were in, in college age, between 15 and 25, of coming up with an idea for fixing something that wasn't right in their environment and succeeding at it, putting a team together, being encouraged by the environment that they were in, doing it, and having that feeling, that hugely empowering feeling that they could do it. And that then meant that they grew up uh, and went on and went forth in the world and turned into the adults that they were, who then, when they came upon the next thing, built businesses to solve those problems. So that's why Ashoka is now focused on the most important engines of future change leaders in the world, which is our universities. And we're thrilled to be partnering with the new school to maximize all the opportunities possible in this amazing place. With shrinking resources and growing social need, the world needs to get smarter about putting the resources in the hands of change makers like you guys. So Marina Kim, who is the head of this program, you'll hear from her later, but we are thrilled to be here. That's a little bit about how we see the world and uh, how we'll be looking forward to partnering with you. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Um, as I understand that there'll be, your, there'll be eight people from New School who will be part of this program? Is that what, or a number of them, or is there students? I'm sorry, students? Well, the, I mean, the way that, that the way that our program works, and again, Marina, I don't know where you are. She can, she can speak to it much more intelligently than I can. But, but we are not only working with a few people. We are look, working with the entire institution. And what we do is we put together teams of people from the administration, the faculty, and the students who work together to create ever-expanding circles of change within the university. Great. Got it. Thank you. Um, Paul, you want to go next? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Billy, you want to go next? <laughs> Why not? Okay. Very humble. I like that. Um, I'm also thrilled to be here tonight um, and was thinking on my way over here that if a program like this had existed when I was in college, uh, I might not have dropped out. Um, so I think it's really great what Ashoka and the New School are doing, uh, and I'm excited to, to be here. Um, my journey as a social entrepreneur began, uh, I would say, the summer after my sophomore year of college. I uh, spent that uh, summer in India. I was studying community forestry. And I had an opportunity to travel to uh, a place called Gangotri, which is the base camp uh, that's the source of the Ganges River up in the Himalayas. And I hiked from the base camp up to the glacier that feeds the river. And I met with scientists there who were studying the glacier. And, uh, they told me where it had been the year before and the year before that and that it was retreating up into the mountains. It was melting um, at a rate that was much faster than anyone had predicted and that uh, the glaciers would be gone by 2030 um, if global warming continued at this pace. And 400 million people relied for their fresh water on the glacial melt that fed this river. And I had gone to India thinking that my work was over there. I was developing my own major in international sustainable development. And uh, that whole experience just took me completely off the tracks and, and freaked me out in a way that I came back and, and decided I needed to do something. I didn't know what I would do. But uh, the first thing that came to mind was that I would organize a student, regional student conference. Um, and I took a semester off to organize it, and things sort of started snowballing. And that semester turned into a year, and that year turned into eight years now. And I'm here with you all today. Um, and that process over the last eight years has really been a kind of trial and error. How, how do we build a social movement uh, of young people has been my focus to transform our society and to combat global warming. Um, I think uh, my first real innovation was in, I started, I, I organized this regional conference and 
we started another student organization. It was another sort of student network. And turned out there were already a bunch of student networks. And they started trying to take ours over. And uh, there was all kinds of bl bad blood. And the first thing I did was sort of realize that what we needed was not another organization in an already sort of splintered movement, but what we needed was a coalition. So I shifted the orientation and we turned it into what became the Energy Action Coalition. Um, and we, we started this, uh, we did a, a joint fundraising campaign. We, we decided let's not all compete for funding with each other, let's see if we can do something all together. So we created a, a, this, um, a joint fundraising effort for our first major campaign, which was called the Campus Climate Challenge. And our idea there was to support young people, students all over the country in making their schools models of the sustainable future that we wanted to see. Um, you know, the idea being, being that uh, that's where young people had the most ability to make change. We couldn't start, you know, by trying to change federal policy. You know, people had been trying that for decades. We, we thought, let's build this movement from the bottom up. Let's transform the places where we have the most power, um, the most ability to make change. And throughout this campaign, 650 colleges have committed to becoming climate neutral, to having no net carbon emissions, transforming their curriculum. So that was really the, the sort of first effort that we, that we started with. And you know, we've tried a, a hundred different things over, over the course of, of these last eight years. Um, I helped start a green music label called Green Owl Records to work with musicians, to put out music, to, to try to make it cool um, to, to do this work. Uh, we organized these days of action. You know, it would be Fossil Fools Day on April 1st or Campus Clean Energy Day or Energy Independence Day where you know, hundreds, thousands of schools around the country would do a film screening or do an event or an action on the same day to try to build solidarity, community across the country um, to show that there was a movement of young people. Um, we organized two big national conferences called Power Shift in Washington where we had young people coming to lobby their members of Congress to testify before Congress. Uh, we organized the largest ever nonviolent civil disobedience action shutting down a coal plant that uh, provided electricity to Congress. Um, you know, we tried uh, so many different things, but a couple of years ago, this sort of nagging feeling that it wasn't enough, what we were doing wasn't enough. We, all of the indicators were still um, moving in the wrong direction. Um, you know, I started thinking, how do we take what we're doing and multiply it by 100? We were already working at 1,000 schools. You know, we had all of these campus victories. But I, I kept thinking that our model, the way we were doing things, wasn't, wasn't big enough. It wasn't engaging as many young people as we needed to. And I also had the sort of um, the, the uh, concern or, or fear that we were creating all of this demand for careers in doing something about this problem, that we were training all these young people to, and educating them about this issue, giving them some of the tools to do something about it, but there just weren't the jobs. So all of this led to uh, an idea that I had uh, at the beginning of 2007. I, I had a, a vision of then, you know, very early candidate Barack Obama uh, in New Orleans announcing the creation of a clean energy core. The, the idea was based partly on the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression where our country would put millions of people to work doing the work that most needed doing and also looking to put the people who most needed work uh, into those jobs. So. Um, the first person I called was Van Jones, who's an, an, another Ashoka fellow. Um, and um, and we, we built a working group of, of people. We developed this idea and pitched it to the different uh, presidential campaigns, Hillary Clinton and John Edwards' campaign, picked up the idea um, in whole, and, and Barack Obama uh, 
picked up our goal of creating 5 million green jobs. And I don't know if you remember during the campaign that idea, sort of 5 million green jobs became a big part of the campaign. And part of that idea has become law with the Serve America Act. The Clean Energy Service Corps has been created as part of a result of that to create stipended AmeriCorps positions um, for tens of thousands of young people to learn the skills and to begin doing this work of retrofitting buildings, putting up solar panels, restoring habitat, uh, all of those things. And uh, I'll, I'll close by saying sort of where I'm at now and the project I'm working on uh, is I'm writing a book, um, the working title of which is Make Money and Change the World. Very relevant, I think, to many of the people here. And the reason uh, I have a co-author uh, who I'm writing it with, and our idea behind the book is that that has become, I think, sort of the, the holy grail of our generation, that people no longer just want to make money. Um, it's not fulfilling en enough. It's, um, and I think many of us know too many people who are just trying to save the world and are not meeting their own needs. Um, so we're, we're writing this book as sort of stories and strategies, life advice for young people on, on how to do both. And our feeling is that this is already happening. This is a movement that is sort of across this country. It's intergenerational. It's, it's part of a transformation of our society from this kind of locust economy to a honeybee economy where we're all working together. Um, and it's a leaderless movement too. It's kind of bottom up. Everyone, um, you know, it's part of Ashoka's mission of everyone a change maker. That it's it's not an elitist movement. It's uh, it's a populist movement. It's a movement that all of us uh, uh, need to be a part of. Really, thank you. Uh, locust to honeybee. That's a wonderful. Uh, I like that. Um, also, that five million green jobs figure coming from you. That's really. That whole history is fantastic. It's very interesting, fascinating. Uh, Paul, you ready now? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, can you hear? Is this okay? <clears throat> um, I went around before this meeting started. What? He wants a picture of you. Oh, a picture. Oh, the picture. The picture. Oh, okay. So you can get a picture. I thought you wanted me to pitch something. <laughs> uh, I talked to several students about, I said I was a panelist and what would they like to hear about? And uh, one woman who is a, a student at the nonprofit uh, management, I think that's, if I understand it, that's management where you can't have people like Muhammad and Jesus participate, right? Is that? Uh, anyway, uh, sh <laughs> it, t it takes a little while. Uh, Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> Any, uh, she had uh, a very interesting thing, and, and I can't see her. Can you identify yourself? She's Is over it? here on the left. Oh. Reith, yeah. Would you mind repeating what you would like to hear about? Uh, which question? <laughs> no, it's not a question. I asked you what, what uh, you would like to learn, and you said... Well, one of the things um, I was wondering about coming here is that for many people, first hearing about social enterprise, it, it seems sort of intimidating here, you know, sitting in front of panelists who have achieved so much already in the fancy hall and all the fancy trappings. But for students just starting out, some of young, who's unsure, and certain, what are some of the things we could do, perhaps from your own experience or what you've learned, or just any suggestions you have for us coming in? So in case everybody didn't hear it, uh, just to paraphrase, the, the term social entrep entrepreneurs is a little intimidating. If you're an ordinary student, how do you go about doing something? Is that putting it? Yeah. Uh, and what I said was, um, really, my thing is, just do it. Uh, because when I started doing the work I've done for the last 28 years, I have no training whatsoever in what I ended up doing. I, I, my formal training is as a 
physician and a psychiatrist. But the problems that I was interested in, uh, because uh, as a psychiatrist, I work a lot with, with homeless people and chronically mentally ill people who are very poor, and their poverty was more important than their mental illness. So we started to learn about how to do stuff with poverty, but poor people here are really very wealthy on a world scale. So I went to Bangladesh to talk to some, and, and all along, the whole thing was to learn from the people you're working with, not to come with ideas. So I went to Bangladesh, and, and those poor people said, and these were farmers who made their living on one acre of land and who lived on less than a dollar a day. And they said they were poor because they didn't have enough money. And the way to stop being poor is to make more money from farming. And I said, how can you do that? And they said, well, the first thing is we need water control for the crops because we grow everything in the rainy season and everybody else grows it and the, then the prices are low. And so I've looked around and one thing led to another. My point is, this doesn't sound too imposing, does it? I mean, it, the things are fairly obvious. It's not too... Uh, difficult to grasp if pe poor people, really poor people say they're poor because they don't have enough money. Although that's highly controversial in the field of development. So I believe what people told me and basically I have felt that the way to learn how to do something that makes a difference is to first talk to the people and learn from them and go to where they are and learn everything about their space. So I did that over 25 years with $3,000 a day family. And they taught me everything that I know. But it runs counter to what the formal experts say in many respects. So we then designed very, very cheap water lifting and water distribution, drip irrigation and treadle pumps, and marketed them through the private sector. And, by, and, and I don't do anything unless you can sell at least a million of them. So we tried to build scale into the beginning, from the beginning, and in the end, IDE, the organization that I started, uh, increased the income of dollar-a-day farmers enough that 17 million people moved out of poverty, which is still a drop in the bucket. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, I didn't know what I was doing, but I went and talked to the people. Whatever problem you're interested in, go and talk to the people that have the problem and learn what their context is, and you'd be amazed. Sometimes we make things far too complicated, I think. Uh, so what I'm doing now, uh, what, very quickly after I uh, talked to a lot of these people, I became convinced that for rural poverty, one-acre farmers, we, I needed to work on fomenting four revolutions. Water, design, marketing, and agriculture. And without going too much into detail, uh, Pretty much all the designers in the world spend all their time solving the problems of the richest 10% of the world's customers. Design has to change to encompass the other 90%. Agriculture is big agriculture. Uh, the poverty in the world is tiny agriculture. None of the PhDs uh, courses can teach anybody from Bangladesh or Ethiopia how to raise three goats and some chickens. And those are, that's a level of problems. Uh, water, uh, all the big water organizations and the formal expertise in, in organizations like in, uh, ICID, uh, 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 irrigation and drainage, focuses on big systems, big drainage systems. You need things, uh, affordable tools like a $3 drip kit that'll work on a, on, on a kitchen garden uh, or a quarter acre plot. And markets, the most effective way of reaching scale is by facilitating markets. So a couple of years ago, I left IDE, handed it off to an, uh, my successor. Now I'm working on uh, DREV, which is an, a nonprofit to foment the design revolution. And the market piece, I think, can best be, you can create a revolution in markets by, well, I formed a private company called Windhorse. Uh, it, its uh, mission is to make money serving people who live on less than $2 a day. I'm leaving on Friday to go to India to start the beta tests of uh, water kiosks that, that provide 10,000 liters a day of safe drinking water and energy kiosks that provide electricity. 
uh, uh, the water will be a quarter cent a liter, which is an attractive price, but if you sell 10,000 liters, it's enough to pay off the whole thing in four to six months. And I want a, a large, to form eventually, a large multinational corporation that will make money and demonstrate through co the competition of the marketplace that that's what you need to do. So that's the end of the story. That's, that's the beginning of the story. Yeah. Um, and of course, in describing this process, you begin with going to the people and listening to the people, which is core basic design process. You go to the population, whether it's high school kids at a mall or people living at a village in the bottom of the pyramid, and you observe, you participate, you listen, and then you begin to build. So from the very beginning, you were a designer, even though you didn't know it. Yeah, that's right. And there isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know how to do that. Fascinating. Okay, good. Sarah, what's your story? Oh, my word. So um, as I sit here and I look out, and uh, you look like such a nice and earnest crowd. Um, you know, it, it does really strike me. This seems very loud. But um, to, to sort of get at the heart of social entrepreneurship, what I'm going to try and do is go back, give you just a little sense of uh, sort of how I grew up, what I did, um, and uh, try to relate this back to what is what is your journey and and how can can you take one? And one thing that's really been striking me is that, you know, when I started doing what I do, I had no idea what social entrepreneurship was or that I even was one. But I would say that even the concept label being good or bad, is that it gave me a lot of courage. Um, it gave me a courage to be a free thinker, and it gave me a lot of courage to um, be a doer. And I think that if you ever want to really achieve anything um, in life, it really is about having a certain sense of, of, of a courage and a resilience and finding that, and that there's no secret to that. You know, you find it where, where you find it. And I think that that, that essence, and you know, I, um, I often think of this, this sounds so completely cheesy, but I call it the love theory. And it's really about finding the thing that you love. And um, some people you know, just can't get enough of private equity. Um, some people are ceramicists, and some people are tennis players. But you know when you, when you look at yourself in the mirror if what you're doing has that love thing. And it doesn't mean like, it's all fun every day because you know that's where the resilience piece kicks in because it's not. But um, so let me just start by saying I um, I actually grew up in Brooklyn. I'm indigenous to the region, and um, <laughs> my parents. Uh, my grandfather was a garment worker. He became a vice president of the Ladies Garment Workers Union. My father was a union side labor lawyer. My mother was a teacher who was active in her union. And um, I thought the only thing you could actually be was um, a worker or a trade unionist, and in fact wrote that in my college <laughs> application. So it's sort of shocking that I got in anywhere. But um, so in my family, it, being like an entrepreneur, you know, remember this was like the 1960s and 1970s wasn't something that like lefties were particularly proud about. And so, um, but this was sort of how I started on this perverse journey um, in doing what I do. So let me just say, you know, it's sort of funny, it says working today in the freelancers union, and I bet most of the people here have heard potentially of the freelancers union and not at all of working today, and we'll get to that in a minute. But so work, so freelancers union is a membership Union. It's a new form of unionism. We have 120,000 members nationally. We um, have a budget that's now $80 million because we've started our own for-profit insurance company that's wholly owned by the nonprofit. So the non the nonprofit though is not a C3, a charity. It's a C4, which is a political organization. So what we're able to do is actually economically align the interests of our members so that our dollars are starting to work for us. And then on top of that, we believe that you need to have power in markets, but you also have to have power in politics. So we just started a PAC, and um, I hope everybody voted on our slate that we just put up. So, and I'm seriously not kidding. OK. So I'm going to now just um, sort of tell you the, where, where my sort of epiphany came from. And you'll see that it was very, um, 
not clear that it was going to lead to this. So to the idea that you have to have like some vision that's like in a box with a bow, no, it's like a gut. It's like a feeling of something. So I, of course, I've been working for unions since I'm 18 years old. I've worked for like almost every different union. I was a union organizer when I graduated. I worked in a nursing home in order to organize it, which we did. I went to law school and became a union side labor lawyer, all for what's now at CIU. And um, so then I had this case uh, in New York, and we were organ. It was a, a hospital, and uh, without saying the hospital, uh, the hospital had created like this beautiful new wing. And this is like 15 years ago, so I don't even know what the prices are now. But let's say $3,000 a night, and you would stay in the room that was like beautiful, and you'd have Crabtree and Evelyn's soap, and you'd have. Um, <laughs> really good food, and uh, it was separate from the rest of the hospital. The only problem was that when we started looking at who the workers were, it just coincidentally happened that everybody was, for the most part, under 40 and white. And so it became clear, like, there's something going on here. And again, the, the union was SEIU, 1199, one of the strongest unions. And so, you know, I went to investigate for the, the arbitration case, and the issue in the arbitration was, were this particular group of workers, were they management or not? And I was thinking, this is the, the, that's the legal issue, but really the issue is like a, a race and age case. So I went and I interviewed people, and the most profound interview for me was I was sitting in the courtyard outside the kitchen, and there were these bunch of older black men who had been cooking for their entire lives. And basically, this was like a complete slap in the face that was saying, you know, your cooking is just essentially not good enough. We don't want you. And there was something about the loss of self-esteem that people were facing that, you know, I, I can't tell you that that was the thing, but I can tell you like that moment completely changed me. And I started to think like there's something so profoundly wrong with the way we've set up our laws and our regulations and our structures that we can't even like have a conversation about like what this is, let alone even do something about it. And so I hope that you could see that this was completely intuitive. The strategy was either non-existent or completely fuzzy, but I said, sort of like Bill Drayton, I need a year off, I need to think. And so I started to um, really think about what is a union? So I had grown up with a union and you know, for people here who know um, labor law or employment or have worked at unions, you know, our labor laws were written in the 1930s and sometimes people think that that means that they were like you know, written in stone and that's what a union is. But that's where social entrepreneurship comes in because if you don't think that that's the definition of something, it, you don't have to make it the definition of something. You can say, well, that's how people saw it in the 1930s. But actually, I know that when Moses left in the Exodus, um, I know that all the people said to Moses, go and fight the, the, the boss because the work is really bad. And, you know, long story short, you know, Exodus was the first labor struggle. And in between, we've had mutual aid societies and guilds and craft unions and industrial unions. So, yes, the laws were written in the 1930s, but the laws can be changed. And so that thinking got me to, to think, well, how could we form like a new form of unionism? And what is a union? Well, a union is really has two basic core principles. One is it has to bring people together to solve their own problems. And two, it has to have an independent business model. And that's where entrepreneurship came in. And I, again, you know, labor and entrepreneurship are not two things that we in this, this era think of, but actually the great trade unionists were the ones who created the healthcare centers and the housing movement and almost every, the, the civil rights movement uh, actually was, um, uh, the turning point in the civil rights movement was uh, with uh, the labor movement. Uh, a lot of the sleeping car porters with the early black trade unionists were actually uh, trained in the labor movement and the, and the skills brought over to the civil rights movement. So to say that labor wasn't entrepreneurial is just not true. So, um, I don't know where I am in my five minutes, but let me just say quickly, so power and markets and power and politics, it was very weird for a lefty type person to be talking about markets, but I have to say it completely changed my life because once you start figuring out where the money is, you can start figuring out where the power is and how you will get some breathing room to think about what your strategy is because somebody has to pay for R&D and it's not typically foundations or government. Amen. 
Right. So, uh, this, somebody said this line, and I always steal it, and I wish I could remember, but the revolution will not be foundation funded. Um, <laughs> and then I just have to quote one other thing from Van Jones, uh, a good, I guess, a friend of many in this room. When we were at some conference, he said, we are all autodidacts. And I said, yeah. And then like, I had to run home and say, like, what's an autodidact? <laughs> and, um, and so essentially, it's the ability to self-learn. And so what you do is you, when you figure out that love thing and what is yours, and you start asking and talking to people, and you figure out you know, what's, what's the issue here that you have to study and learn, well, then you have the courage to grow to understand it. So in our case, the first thing was health insurance an area I knew nothing about, nor did I care, but you have to learn it, you know, and then it's retirement, soon it's gonna be credit unions, and I think that's the common thread. So nobody should be intimidated, you should just be figuring out, you know, you've got like the energy and passion and love, like what's your love thing, and is it gonna be such that you'll have that resilience when things go bad? And I think for us, a success to failure rate is, we have one success to nine failures, and I think that's damn good, so, um, you know, Fail. Go out and fail. Yay. <laughs> okay, so let's get a little granular now, all right? So um, let's say you, in fact, find your passion, fall in love with an issue. Um, how do you make an impact? How do you go from engagement to... Um, doing something that is meaningful in terms of changing the lives, transforming the lives of the people you are working with and for? How does that work? Who wants to talk about that? I can. Okay. Uh, impact is, is, to me is not a concept. It's a part of design. Uh, you have to build impact into the design of every project from the very beginning. If you go to a village in Bangladesh and, and talk to the villagers about what their problems are, you'll quickly learn with them that there are maybe 20 or 30 things that are important problems. Why not pick out of those 20 or 30 problems the ones that the solution might apply to a thousand villages? So. You, and, and you have to think about how to design impact from the very beginning or else you're wasting your time. So, so there's a, Africa Now is an organization that helped a f one fishing village and then 10 fishing villages in Kenya improve their catch by getting access to ice and markets. The question is, this is on Lake Victoria, how would you go to 1,000 villages? Well, one of the, one of the issues that comes up is you're going to knock off too many fish. So how do you keep the fish population alive? Uh, how do you uh, expand the market? How do you build an, an, a, a commercial structure that you can deal with all of those fish? You've got to think about that from the very beginning, or you're not going to be successful. So what I hear is scale, size, market. Market, very important. What other factors are, are involved? Yeah. Um, I, I would say that uh, when I when I talk to groups, uh, a lot of the times what what I do is is I, I was lucky enough when I got out of college to be a reporter for a while. And the great thing about being a reporter is, you sort of a story happens, somebody's for it, somebody's against it, somebody's affected by it. You figure out you 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 can do a stakeholder map around any issue, any story, any happening. And so really if you become passionate about something and you want to change it, the first thing that, that uh, in informing the, the social enterprise is doing a stakeholder map around it. I mean, who's going to actually care about this? Who, who is this, if you solve the problem, who is going to benefit from it, in what way? Uh, if you solve the problem, who might it mess up, in what way? Um, in whose best interest in, is it, et cetera. That way you can then figure out, A, who's going to li be likely to want to help you, and then, and, then, and then you take the subset of that and figure out who has the resources in that group, 
of what sort, and then you figure out why would they help you, basically because you're helping them achieve their goals as an entity. And, and you kind of work your way out that way. And that's how, in each of the organizations that I've started, I start out sort of being given a goal or giving myself a goal and then figuring out, okay, who's gonna want to have this happen and who will pay for it in what way, shape, or form? And the thing that social entrepreneurs are so good at and that all of these guys who are who are stars at this are so good at is, is thinking of resources not only in the form of cash, but you know, with a capital R, it's it's in kind. Most most of the resources you need are in kind. They're in people. They're in space. They're in donated things. They're in they're in all sorts of of uh, of of elements of uh, the different stakeholders in in the environment. So that's how I've done it, and that's how often we work with our social entrepreneurs in thinking about how to grow what they're doing. So is this sort of a smorgasbord model where you you have a goal, you have an idea, you have a vision, and you look for resources in various areas, and you use whatever you can get, whether it's public or non-public or government or private, is, yeah. is that I it? I mean, you figure out of all the stakeholders out there that care about this issue in one way or another, why would they give, you know, who has what you want? in order to accomplish your goal, and why would they give you what you want in order to accomplish their goal? Why is it in their best interest? And then you can put the whole thing together into a business model and go. Hmm. It sounds a little top-down to me. Yeah, see, I, I, I think Which first could all, be good or not. I think there's no one way to skin this cat. So I think that, like, for me, I would say I always have the vision you know, where I want to go, and then I have, like, what I think are the one or two or three strategies, and then, strangely, it almost feels more like um, dot-com work of get it out there, get criticism of it, kick the tires, and keep iterating, and mm -hmm. then uh, if something's not working, just get rid of it, don't worry about it, and then yeah. figure out what the next thing is, but it, it, but it is toward a larger thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, when you were doing the, the early water stuff, and you were going into villages and you were talking to people and listening to people. How much of what they said, I know a lot of what they said informed you, but in a very specific way, how, how did it inform you? In terms of uh, markets, in terms of partners, in terms of, or did you just bring that package with you from your Western experience? No package, it's all learning from the ground mm. up, but but mm. you know when I listen to the people here uh, uh, on the panel talking, it's a thing about how you think right. to begin with. If you don't think scale, you ain't going to get there. So you're talking five million. Uh, you're not talking about one union with three people. You're talking about a union movement. It's how you think. So uh, for me, it started with. Okay, uh, uh, I talked to people in Bangladesh, and they needed water control. So I looked around, what is there available, because the water is shallow, and I learned about the roar pump. And that costs about the same as a sack of rice. And, and in order to reach scale, it's got to make money for poor people. Uh, and, and in fact, that seemed to pay itself in three, four months. So that worked. And uh, then how do you sell? So we started with rower pumps, and then we went to treadle pumps. But the question is, the Mennonite Central Committee had sold 2,000 rower pumps in five years. What's a, just to describe that, the two It's tons. a Stairmaster uh, that activates two cylinders that sucks water. So you're walking on it? You're walking on mm -hmm. it, which is a walking motion. So that's a lot more efficient than going like this, because mm -hmm. walking is a very efficient biomechanical way of working. Right. And, uh, and those cylinders go up and down and it pumps water. 80% uh, of Bangladesh, the water table in the dry season, when you get more for your vegetables, is uh, 10, 15 feet from the surface. So if, uh, and this treadle pump is, uh, you can buy it for a sack of rice. It costs eight bucks. So it's mm -hmm. very important. If it's not affordable, you won't bring it to scale. Yeah. So now how do they sell treadle pumps or anything in Bangladesh? Well, there are village dealers that sell it. There are manufacturers that make it. and you've got to have technicians to install it. So we set up a thing that uh, first build, built market demand because no 
dealer is going to make a living unless he or she can sell 30 pumps in a season. So the first thing was to do a mass marketing for people with no, uh, with no media. So we made a Bollywood film and it showed to a million people. Did you star in it? No. No, no I tried, but they, they said I wasn't the right skin color. Uh, no, I mean, this is like, the, we hired the top director in Bangladesh, the top male lead, the top female lead, and, and we told a story that had the key messages, and it showed to an average audience of 5,000 people, and a, a million people a year. And, and we built it so that the dealers that we had recruited would come to each showing and bring their potential customers. And then there were the, it was an hour and a half, and at the suspense point, uh, it stopped, and the dealers got people up on treadle pumps. And in the end, the treadle pump won the day. And, but in, in rural Bangladesh, people will gather to watch a fly crawl across your hand because it's... it's, it's in those days, so so yes. so it's like that. But anyway, the thing of it is that uh, from the beginning, when we took that over from the Mennonite Central Committee, I set a goal, which I pulled out of the out of the air, of selling twenty thousand treadle pumps a year. Because the uh, uh, Mennonite Central Committee had sold two thousand in five years, and it's not worth doing if if you if you can't do something more than that. So we started with that. And we ended up recruiting 75 manufacturers, two, two or 3,000 village dealers, and we trained 3,000 well drillers with a three-day program and a certificate. And that ended up selling uh, one and a half million treadle pumps in Bangladesh. And if somebody bought a treadle pump for $8 and put it on a well for $25, the average net return in the first year was $100. So it was self... Uh, See what I mean? I'm, I'm, I apologize for going on for so long, but it's, it's like it, it all makes sense if you look at what it would take to reach a lot of people. And why fool around uh, if you're going to sell instead of 2,000, 4,000? Yeah, yeah. Well, I like, I like the detail here. Oh, okay. uh, you were involved in the marketing of it initially, uh, in the training of people. 75% of the work was mass marketing. Mm -hmm. The movie. And then the training of people? We, we, we hired uh, 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 people, uh, local balladeers. They sing songs, and, uh, and, and, and uh, they're, they're sort of troops in the beginning. But then the way to get to scale with that was to do a movie, because then you could reach mm -hmm. a million. You see what I mean? You've mm -hmm. got, you got to think scale for, uh, all the way through, that's all. Mm -hmm. Billy, you have some thoughts on this? Uh, yeah. Especially, let me just frame that just a little bit. In terms of corporate partners, I'm very interested in the relationship between doing good and using corporations as, as partners in here. I had a separate thought, although that's a good, good thread to pick up on. I, I think there's an element that um, millennials and, and even younger people are, are particularly suited for, which is a kind of crowdsourcing. Uh, I think that you know, for our campaign, the Campus Climate Challenge, it was similar to what Paul was talking about, where it's, you know, that running that kind of campaign was what the students we were working with were most interested in. So there was kind of, uh, there's an, a sort of listening to what people want and what people need. So there's that, that sort of crowdsourcing element. We got our logo, you know, half of the things we did, we sort of put out on Craigslist or over, you know, our listservs, and we got back these ideas. And then there's this remixing element which is sort of, I think a lot of the major innovations are just little tweaks on things that already exist. So, um, you know, those are both things that I think our generation is particularly suited to do. And, and uh, you know, a lot of it is just about listening and tweaking. That's fascinating. Um, there are a couple of uh, microphones that are set up. Uh, if you want to, and please, Start asking questions. Uh, if you feel that you don't want to stand up in front of a microphone, just stand up and shout. Um, but if you use a microphone, we'll hear your voice on the tape. So, um, Can I ask the audience yeah. a question? This is the time where we're having full engagement. <laughs> Questions coming back and forth. Here uh, you go. Here's a question uh, of the students. If you, if you 
force yourself to say what your primary reason for being at university is. How many of you would say that the primary reason is to make a living when you graduate, and how many would say it's to learn to make a difference? You need to ask one and then the other. Yeah, yeah, okay. one and then the other. How about okay. me? <laughs> uh, how, how many of you are here primarily to learn uh, how to make a living when you graduate? I know, but I just want to be with those people because they feel like. <laughs> There's a kind of. How many uh, are here primarily because you want to learn to make a difference? How about both? How about three? Exactly. Okay. Uh, how many of you have lied? <laughs> uh, well, here's the thing. Um, what I did, and everybody got a different solution. My first business was when I was 15. I grew seven and a half acres of strawberries and sold them in Hamilton. Uh, by the time I started IDE, I had made enough money, not a huge amount, that I could work for nothing for seven years. So that's, I mean, I, I worked as a volunteer for seven years. Everybody else has got a different thing. And in terms of grants, uh, I learned how to write a grant. When I, when I started, it turned out all, all our members were interested in health insurance, and I had these kinds of questions, and so, I started by talking to anybody who would talk to me. So I would talk to brokers. And so not just, it wasn't, I wasn't looking for yes, no. I was looking for what makes your mind tick, broker person. What, what do you care about? So I would say, you know, the question that I would ask is, why should they care about what you have to say, right? What are you bringing to the table to them that would make them want to hear you? And if it's not today, well, then what do you need to do in the next couple of months? And, and why, you know, so that you're constantly thinking from all these different perspectives to get to that goal. Hold on one second, there was someone back here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tara Lawson Reamer. I'm actually a faculty member, not a student, uh, in the graduate program in international affairs. And first, I just wanted to say I'm very inspired by all of your stories, and it's very exciting to have this partnership. And, Wonderful to hear your pathways and doing the work that you've done. So I actually had two questions. Um, the first one is an issue that I think is, is of great concern within GPIA. And it speaks to how you uh, incorporate measurement, measurement of impact, measurement of success. Because an idea can sound really good on paper, uh, and it can seem to meet a need. But when you get down to whether it's actually serving the needs of the community, it's not clear that it does so. For example, um, you know, a classic example that people talk about or like to talk about is malaria bed nets. And clearly malaria is a big problem. You distribute malaria bed nets. Often they're not used um, to prevent malaria, but are instead used to catch fish. And so this, this mm -hmm. gap between a perceived solution and how do we measure whether it's actually creating an impact. Um, and I think that's a really important to think about and would love to hear the perspective on how to incorporate that from the ground up. And then the second question I was hoping you would address was there's a, a key assumption um, running through a lot of the work that Ashoka does and require challenging those who have the resources and disrupting the status quo in ways that are unfavorable to them. And this speaks perhaps uh, to Billy's work, but you know, we can talk about climate change and clearly doing something about uh, carbon emissions, for example, is going to require undermining the financial positions of some of the uh, world's most powerful companies. Um, so how do we think about harnessing resources when, in fact, the work that you're doing runs exactly counter to the interests of those who have resources? Hell of a question. Um, and it challenges a little bit of the um, kumbaya sentiment on the, uh, in terms of working with uh, all partners uh, equally. Uh, I guess the question is, well, the question is obvious. Who wants to uh, dig into it a little bit? When you challenge the local powers or the powers that be, what do you do? Uh, I, first of all, I think there's this really good book called Disruptive Innovations by Clay Christensen. I don't know if people have read that, but it's, I, I think it's a really interesting book and it's looking at um, different, like a, an example, 
just to be really fast, is that th there are different markets within a particular industry, and you can pick different pieces of the bottom, often the bottom part of a market that many companies are focusing on because you have a different view of like what you can do there. And so you don't have to take on, you know, the big heavyweight until you're like, you know, working out for like a couple of years, you know, and you're working up the market and then, mm -hmm. <sighs> and so, you know, you just sort of have to figure out like where and how you're going to do that. And I don't think it is actually all kumbaya. I think it's a cultural difference. And I think, you know, if we had another two hours, another interesting conversation is that, you know, this is a different kind of social movement than the social movement of the 60s. I think in the 60s, it was talking about getting resources from the wealthiest because our empire was really so wealthy. And so we needed to be much more like tear down and in your face. And I feel like the world has kind of evolved where our empire is not as robust as it was back then. And we now have to be thinking about mutual aid strategies, strategies that are builders. We have to be builders. We have to be building things up. And that's not to say that it's avoiding a fight. That's saying you want to actually win and achieve something. And so I think it's a very different orientation. You know, I don't, I don't actually think it's necessarily kumbaya. But I think it's a much better way to live because you figure out, you know, where you're going to have the uh, partners and the people that you like to be around every day. It's a much more sustainable way to live. But uh, I'll take an alternate alternative approach to answering that question. I agree with what Sarah's saying, but I also think that um, you know, old-fashioned activism is like the other piece of this that is critical and. You know, for example, um, my wife is from a community on the Navajo Reservation in northern Arizona called Black Mesa, and Peabody Coal Company has been mining there for 35 years. It's the largest coal company in the world, and, you know, they can develop new social innovations and other technologies, but it has taken you know, nonviolent civil di disobedience, it has taken the community, old-fashioned community organizing, to shut down one of those mines there. And, um, you know, there are lots of examples of that throughout history. So um, I think, uh, you know, I agree. And I, my orientation these days is much more around building collaboration, um, you know, developing alternative solutions. But uh, I, I think that there will always be a role for activism, for um, uh, old fashioned community organizing. So, one quick Good. thing. There, there are lots of ways of uh, making things change, but the market approach to me is uh, creating mass movement, movements where you find things where people will act in their own self-interest and organizations will act in their own self-interest, and the question is how to do that. Yep. Now, that, that whole market mechanism means that some organizations die. Uh, the disruptive innovation talked about how uh, the big disk drive companies died because they couldn't adapt, and that's not necessarily bad. But the question is, how do companies and individuals, what strategies are there to act for people to act in their own self-interest? Mm -hmm. Okay, some more questions. I, Michelle. I, I was just going to reference uh, disruptive innovation uh, in response to the comments that you made before. I guess the only thing I want to add is that <clears throat> when the question was, well, what do we do, where do we start, et cetera, et cetera, I think what's, and how do we affect the, the powers that be, the markets, the corporate powers, et cetera. And I think what's extremely important is that it, it's the entrepreneur that actually will demonstrate how to make the change, how, how to make the difference and then influence the larger institutions and systems. And that's what has always been historically the case with on entrepreneurs, whether they're social or not. They demonstrate a different way of doing things and then affect larger systems as a result. Um, so. Well, and that, that goes to, to, to answer the other part of your question, which we, hadn't, we, which we didn't get at, which is metrics. You know, one of the primary metrics, one of the primary ways that Ashoka measures itself is have the entrepreneurs that we have supported actually been able to drive change so that an entire paradigm has shifted and have they affected, and, and one of the largest ways to do that is affecting public policy. 
So one of our key metrics, because we look at shifting whole systems, is have how many of our people that we've supported have changed public policy, i.e., if, in, if an innovation comes up that's a better way to, to be doing uh, rural education um, for uh, poor people in a particular country, and that innovation becomes so successful and so well known and spread so fast that it is taken, o taken on by government and becomes the new system. Or there's an innovation in how to do a much better job of dealing in a sustainable way with um, child care illnesses, uh, ch children's illnesses in, uh, by the hospitals, and that then becomes part of the public health system. That is one of the, one of the definitions of success that we have. Excuse me. Um, I would like to first thank Paul for two things. One is the idea for the movie, which may help him with something I want to do. Um, and the other is the idea of keeping that big scale in mind because I have an idea and people have been telling me, well, just start off real small first. And I'm not sure that's the way to go. But the other thing is people are talking about resources. And you can see from my hair that I'm old, okay? Second year baby boomer. Um, but you listen to Paul, you listen to the gentleman who's going to be making movies to make a difference. And there are many of us that have either lost our jobs because we have gray hair or are retiring to get out of the way or because we can. And many of us miss the boat on making a difference the first time and would like to make a difference now. Talk to your grandma. You know, talk to your grandpa. They may know people in a company that you're interested in changing or know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And um, we're in a position where we may be able to give you some links and give you some feet on the ground and um, work, workers, worker bees, who can help you to get your idea started. So, you know, don't discount old folks. You know, we used to look like you once. <laughs> Intergenerational teams are very effective. More questions, yeah. I'm trying to create an idea that because of whether it's the recession or just because I've been in the apparel industry, there's a lot of clothes that go to waste and a lot of people who are freezing and don't have them across the world. So we're, I'm trying to create a model by which all companies would create a system of encouraging their customers to come back and bring purchases that they've already had. They get a discount towards a future purchase, so they're actually generating their own customer base. But then the clothes that they're bringing back, we would take and try and donate to charities and organizations across the world. Now, I just made that up two and a half weeks ago because I was so frustrated with where I was working and was trying to put this together. And um, that being said, my question is, I went into a little boutique and someone on a very individual level was doing just that at a little dress shop just on the Upper West Side. And I started to get intimidated. I'm like, what if this is already happening and I don't know it? Or how do I decide if I should do this myself and try and do it the best way I can or try to engage in an existing organization? Now, when I've tried to do that, I've found that existing organizations aren't actually receptive to people like me who have 20 years of business experience because I don't have nonprofit experience. So I'm actually finding as I'm trying to just do it that there's a weird recept, there, there's not as much of a receptivity to people who actually have real skills to help other organizations because we don't have that background. And do you have any advice on, on whether or not you just try and bridge that gap or you start from scratch? Because I'm not 19, I'm 40 and I'm in that you know, I need to like know what I'm gonna, I still have to like balance my energy with my starting to get tired. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I just like, it's not as, you know, I'm not starting fresh, so I, I feel like I have some of those life stages to also balance. So it's kind of a personal question and, and a professional one. So some advice, yeah. Uh, I think that your experience in the apparel industry is <coughs> extremely precious if you really want to do something. But the way to start is to go talk to the people you're going to give those garments to. Yeah. Uh, and my biased view is, for God's sake, don't give them away. 
and don't take clothes from the West and give them to people in Bangladesh because there are thousands of people with Singer sewing machines making clothes in Bangladesh. Go to Bangladesh or go to Africa and find out about the garment business. Use your marketing experience. It's invaluable, but you have to, you have to shape it to the context. And, you know, for instance, here's, here's a crazy idea. People in slums make uh, garment workers, a lot of them, and they make really crappy saris, uh, low end. If you know the Western market, figure out a way to go and uh, be a marketing link. Figure out some way that s some people in the slums in, in India can design, you know the old Hong Kong suits that split when you be bent over? But there's a lot of garment industries now in those countries that put people to work. Figure out a way to make high-end garments, for them to make high-end garments and link them to, and, and do some laser, uh, you know, you, you could do some kind of three-dimensional thing on the net. I don't, I don't know, but <laughs> help poor people who are making crappy money designing pra crappy clothes in developing countries make good money by designing high-end clothes and market them in this country. Now, I'm not saying that's what you should do, but you see what I'm saying? Don't, for God's sake, don't give stuff away from here. That just screws up local markets. There now, that's one strong point of view, but that's what I think. There are lots of, I mean, in, in many of the countries that we have, uh, and we're in 70 different countries around the world, Many, many, you know, one of the biggest challenges is job creation, particularly for women. One of the, pri the primary tipping point issue in getting a society going the right way is giving women the ability to support themselves because they turn around and they take care of their children and their communities and things start snowballing the right way. But in, in many parts of the world, these women's self-help groups are, are starting industries often they have to do with some form of being able to make things of some, you know, somewhere in the, in the industry that you have some experience. The issue in, in many of them that I have gone and visited is that they don't know what the market wants. They don't have a sense of what the market wants. So and that's to build what you on know. Your, you know, to build on your point, if you went, you know, what they need is someone helping them to understand that if they want to be marketing, because they can now do it on the web, if they want to be marketing an X, Y, or Z market, what is the taste? They can take their particular skill set of embroidery or this or that or the other thing, and what is the garment or the whatever that sells in that market, and that kind of help. But I think that the, the other thing that you referenced just briefly, and I, I'll, I'll hit on this because I have so much, I spend so much time with this. I manage our, our global network of business entrepreneurs who mentor our social entrepreneurs. And a lot of times people from the for-profit sector feel that there is a set of ex expertise that they've developed that is in some way superior to the set of expertise in the nonprofit sector. And it is not it is not a perception that's based on feeling superior. It's just, it's a, per, it's, it's a, a feeling you have that somehow you know a bunch of things that the, that the other side doesn't. What ends up happening when our business mentors get together with our social entrepreneurs to mentor them is that most of the time it ends up with the social entrepreneurs mentoring the business entrepreneurs because there is this massive amount of expertise on both sides. It's just different kinds. And so there really is, to really have fun with it and really have it be the way you want it to be, I would just go in with a totally open mind because they're going to have redrawn the picture in ways that you haven't thought about and be coming at your industry in ways that you don't know and, and same for you for them. So, so I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to make that point because that's something that we have found makes a big difference the more open you are. And that comes back to what you were saying, which is you need to relate to them as a person first, and you find some, some way that you, you, you then start moving forward together. But the reality is some nonprofits uh, feel that uh, uh, for-profit businesses are part of the evil empire, and they cause poverty in the first place. Uh, that was really rampant when I started, but it's changing. But it, there are lots of uh, uh, nonprofits that believe in market-driven approaches. And they're even for-profit, non-profits. Yeah, Lots. Right. Lots, exactly. More questions, yeah. I just want to make, 
Um, there's bridgestar.org. Um, probably, you know, idealist.org. Netimpact.org. Just means .org. And common good careers, I think it is. CG.org. But the, they're set up to help people that want to move between the two industries. Okay. Okay, we'll go here. We'll, we'll try and get them all. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, my name is Ralph. I'm actually a NYU student, and uh, I'd like to thank Paul for the advice of just do it. I, I like it. Uh, but building on that, being that many of us are probably in the beginning stages of our change-making trajectory, I'm curious, uh, what would you say is the classic mistake uh, that we would be uh, sort of like, that we would make being specifically in this stage of trying to cultivate an idea, trying to find that passion, trying to know if you're going to make that commitment? Just curious. Just not doing it. <laughs> I'm serious. The, the biggest problem is inertia. People feel unqualified. They feel uh, intimidated. Uh, if, if, I'm not saying just do anything. I'm saying if you, if you go to where the action is in whatever area you're interested in and start learning from the people uh, and the groups and the problem, the solutions are obvious. The big difference is most people are interested in this or interested in that, but they never do anything. They're scared, they're, uh, I don't know what. The big difference is somebody who wants to do, uh, do something meaningful and starts doing it. And then you learn from your mistakes and you, I mean, I think anybody can do that. And, and to me, the biggest, mis biggest problem is people are hesitant to do that for whatever reason. You, you guys are nodding, that's your experience too. I think you have to be very comfortable with making mistakes and you have to just start. The, the, the enemy of, of, of all of this is planning and planning and planning and planning. You gotta go around, you gotta see, you gotta listen, you gotta touch, feel, and then just start and have a tight feedback loop of what's working, what's not working, ditch what's not working, build on what is working, and before you know it, you've created a whole thing. That's just, that's how it actually goes. So here's an example, I mean, I mean like you, you were talking and joking about sharing water and so on. Uh, I wanted to get a drink of water, the pitchers uh, of ice water were out and so I couldn't get a drink of water. I think drinking this kind of stuff when there's, there's safe water in the tap is an abomination. So I said, well, I can fix that. <laughs> So I grabbed one of those empty pitchers. I went to the men's bathroom. I could have gone to the women's. Uh, and I filled it up, and we're drinking the uh, tap water. Uh, well, in, 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 many, in many ways, it's just as simple as that. No big deal, but I got here late, so that was embarrassing. But, sorry. Okay, a couple more, couple more questions. Okay, over here. Hi, group. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what was the name of your Bollywood film? Oh, we did a different one every year. And, oh, so you've done and, several. And, and it's all in Bengali. I, I, can't, uh, I can't pronounce it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just Google it or something. But my second part to that question is that out of your social entrepreneurship, a, a, like an amazing byproduct to me is that you're a filmmaker now also. And I'm very interested in like the revolutionary nature of cinema and how cinema impacts the world like in a tangible way. And I was just wondering how collaborative the process has been for you where you were making this film as a way to mass market a product to people who aren't traditionally like online or maybe that's changed now. But what about the way in, I suppose, is there a way now or are you thinking of a way now for local communities to be able to pitch things back up to you? Like, we really need this, so can you make a movie about this? Is that something that you are already doing or I just was just curious? I, I need, need to explain, I'm not a filmmaker at all. Uh, I mean, in Bangladesh, like, the organization, IDE, has a rule, no more than one foreigner in every country. So people that made that film were all Bangladeshis, they were Bangladeshi staff. Or we film had... producer, excuse me. Huh? It, well, you, you were the catalyst, like you facilitated making that. No, I didn't know, I, I just got the thing going, and, and I supported the idea of the film, but, but there was a guy uh, who came from a marketing firm in, uh, in Dhaka, uh, Mirnal Sirkar, he designed all the key messages that they wanted in the film. 
he's Bangladeshi and he surveyed all of the directors and and so on and he got somebody who both wanted to make who wanted to make an impact so it, it I'm not a I'm not a filmmaker but I'm, I mean I helped make it possible to make a film but you'd have to ask the people who ran the whole thing in the, in Bangladesh I mean they're the ones that did it but I I think if I think I could make a film here. I have no clue how to do it, but I could learn. <laughs> and, and so if this is your area, I guess this is getting boring. Uh, go do it. It's not boring to me. Uh, the last part of the question was just, I guess, maybe the name of that, if you have it, the company that made the film for you? I don't have it, but, but oh. if you send me an email, I could check with IDE Bangladesh. And oh, okay, thank it, you. Yeah. Um, my question's for Lisa. You said that Ashoka measures, uh, part, one of the metrics it uses is determining whether some of the social entrepreneurs have influenced policy, whether, poli whether some of the changes that they brought about has, have been uh, incorporated into policy. And I'd love to hear an example of one of those instances. Well, I, I mean, I, I gave uh, two that were, are actually fellows of ours. Um, well, I'll give you another one. Uh, we have a fellow named Albina Ruiz in Peru who has uh, developed um, micro-enterprises around waste collection. And she has a franchise methodology where she's now, she goes into the slum communities, creates these micro-enterprises that are all um, staffed by local people who then sell the recyclables, who are paid by the government to collect the trash in areas where the government wouldn't normally collect the trash, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. She now has, create, she now has driven uh, change into the whole waste collections uh, laws and systems in Peru have completely been transformed because of her work uh, showing how to make uh, how to make it better for people to be able to live um, in these environments, and also she has she's got about she, actually she's a PhD, um, and what she has done is she has now consulted with the government on how to do safe landfills and um, and have them uh, not pollute the waterways and all of the rest of it. Her, she's now her innovation is now in about. Uh, at least 10 other countries. Can and I just, Can I just say that person is wearing a City Year shirt? Mm -hmm. So City Year is a great yeah. example mm -hmm. where um, if Get people who... City Year shirt. City Year started as a project of Echo and Green and Ashoka. Take it off. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and now, you know, not only is it in almost every single state, but the National yeah. Service, how much did the National yeah. Service people just get in the federal budget? So I'm like, it, yeah. does somebody know? I mean, so that's an example, gazillions again, of dollars yeah. that started as a local project in Massachusetts and yeah. now is fully funded across Great. the country. Great. Thank Last you. question. Back there. How can students in your school uh, get involved in a Great plan. question. Oh, oh perfect. That leads us to the last part. <laughs> Sir, are you a plant? It's a plant. <laughs> you are. He's a bit he's a plant. Okay. So brilliant uh, question. This ends uh, this portion of our engagement with you and our conversation. And I understand we're going to be. Look, let me stop for a moment. There will now be from now on a place on campus here where people can come and have that question answered. Ashoka is here, now on campus. There is an institutional base. We have a professor of social entrepreneur. Please get up. Uh, there will be an institutional base. There is a program. There are professors. Um, but first, let's give everybody a hand. <laughs> <laughs>